Was justice done at the end of the Second World War? Did the most evil men in history meet their end as they should have, or were they smuggled away, their crimes against humanity forgiven, and given jobs in the United States and Britain? 1945 saw VE Day and VJ Day, which were times for mass celebrations. The armies of Nazi Germany and Imperial Japan had been defeated. After nearly six years of worldwide war, the deaths of tens of millions, the destruction of vast swathes of land, with economies crushed and millions displaced, the world could begin to forgive and rebuild. But these victories were bittersweet. As the Allied powers congratulated themselves, the hunt for the makers of this horror had begun. Nazi leaders, SS officers, Gestapo officers, war criminals, camp guards were all being hunted down so they could face prosecution and judgment. Amongst the men being hunted down were also the architects and scientists of Nazi Germany. The men who built Hitler's dream, the buildings, the factories, the roads and the weapons, and the apparatus for the Holocaust. Many of these would face trial and then execution. Some, like Hitler, committed suicide. Others, such as Albert Speer, were imprisoned and then eventually freed. And some just disappeared, perhaps given protection by Allied powers. Potentially, one of these henchmen was SS General Hans Kammler. Have you heard of him? I wouldn't be surprised if you haven't. Kammler was one of the most evil men in the Third Reich. He was one of Hitler's main Holocaust perpetrators, who it is argued traded rocket-making secrets for his freedom and was hidden by the United States of America. During the 1930s and 40s, Kammler was central to the construction of the concentration camp system, including the killing factory that was Auschwitz. Not only was he a key figure in the liquidation of the Jewish people, but later on he took over Hitler's secret weapons program. He ordered tens of thousands of slave labourers and prisoners of war to dig, tunnel, construct, live and work in underground factories. Dean Reuter in his book, The Hidden Nazi, The Untold Story of America's Deal with the Devil, wrote, The Holocaust would not have been as efficient were it not for Kamler. He was integral to the evolution of mass murder. For years after the war, the disappearance of Kamler was put down to him committing suicide or being killed close to the end of the war in 1945. However, Reuter in his book demonstrates that Kamler was delivered to US authorities by the rocket scientist Werner von Braun. Von Braun, who was infamously connected with the Vengeance V2 rocket program, had himself been brought to the USA to ensure the Russians did not get their hands on him and his knowledge. The fact he had designed a terror weapon to be used against civilians did not seem to bother the Americans. But according to Reuter, Kamler was brought to America for the same reason, to ensure the Russians did not capture him. Is it true that the Americans did a deal with this SS officer? This officer who had overseen the murders of tens of thousands of Jews. All America had to do to gain access to Germans' rocket team was to ship them to America and erase their past. Erase their past and cover up Kamler's death. But it appears the Americans couldn't cover up everything and there remains a question mark over his apparent suicide or his death in the last death throes of the Third Reich. For Reuter again claims he has seen records of American investigators questioning Kamler in November 1945. Kamler would not have had as much technical knowledge on rocketry as von Braun, but as his superior, Kamler would have known the location of documents, stocks and where industrial plants were hidden. Some of these would have been hidden inside Russian-occupied Europe. It would have been extremely dangerous for the Western Allies if the Russians were to locate these hidden items. Or perhaps he was spared and then hidden by the Americans because he cooperated with Nuremberg prosecutors investigating Nazi war crimes. So how did Kamler become such a despised, feared and important man in Hitler's Third Reich? Kamler joined the Nazi party in 1931 and began working on construction projects for the fledgling air ministry. Almost immediately, he became a zealot for all things Nazi. A year after Hitler became Chancellor, 
Kamler wrote a paper on Lebensraum, Hitler's grand plan for the expansion of Germany in the search for living space. He theorised that the populations of Eastern Europe would have to be dominated by the Germans colonising these lands. Using his doctorate in civil engineering, Kamler stated that this subjugation of ethnic people would require the murder of 20 to 30 million people. As the Second World War began and Hitler's forces swept east, west, north and south, Kamler began increasing the scale of the final solution. He moved his skills and attention from standard building projects to the architecture of genocide. Amongst other projects, he oversaw the transition of Auschwitz into a death camp, which would eventually see the death of more than one million Jews. He soon proved himself a man of action and an efficient administrator. His signature appears on several preserved work orders, such as turning underground morgues into gas chambers and the installation of a freight elevator to transport corpses up to the crematoria. From grand schemes to tiny details, Kamler had an input. He was nicknamed Dust Cloud for his regular visits and unforgiving pace. Despite being efficient and his work being duplicated around the occupied territories, Reuter still describes him as the most diabolical. His work on Auschwitz and the other death camps saw him soon called upon by the head of the SS, Heinrich Himmler. The next project, the construction of certain secret weapons. These secret weapons were of course Hitler's vengeance weapons, the V1 and V2. The V2 rocket was to become the crowning triumph of Kamler's slave labour empire. These rockets were indeed a terror, created huge areas of devastation, and there was no defence once a rocket was launched. It was also held to produce for Kamler's labourers who worked in desperate conditions with villainous guards watching over them. The V2 statistics were frightening. Measuring 46 feet long, weighing around 12 tonnes and armed with a one-tonne warhead, it had an effective range of 200 miles, could reach speeds of 3,500 miles an hour and could reach a ceiling of around 55 miles. Despite Kamler's huge workforce and infrastructure, the Germans had not got the V2s operational before D-Day. The Germans throughout the war suffered by prioritising too many dispersed projects and the V-weapon programme was thankfully for the Allies one of these. In March 1945, Hitler stripped Goring of his powers over aircraft support, maintenance and supply and transferred these duties to Kamler. This culminated in the beginning of April with Kamler being raised to Führer's General Plenipotentiary for Jet Aircraft. Yet the closing months of the war saw Kamler still demonstrating his murderous tendencies. In late March 1945, Kamler ordered the ZV Division, units that operated the V-2 rockets, to execute forced labourers and their families after his car was held up on a crowded road in the Arnsberg Forest. Kamler was reported to have felt he was under some vague threat, so this riffraff ought to be eliminated. The killings coincided with the evacuation of V-2 units due to the Allied advance into Germany. As the Allies from the east, south and west ground down the last remnants of German defences, the roundup of scientists, leaders and war criminals began. In the midst of this process was Operation Paperclip. Paperclip was a top-secret intelligence programme operated by the United States. Its main goal was to capture and bring to the US more than 1,600 German scientists, engineers and technicians. They would then be employed by the Americans in the post-war years. Many of these captured men were former members and former leaders of the Nazi party. Reuter states that around 5,000 German scientists were brought to the US, including severely tainted men who were involved in the Holocaust and the use of slave labour. Was Kamler in this group of tainted men? It seems that these tainted men, with so much blood on their hands, were seen as vital because of their rocket expertise and were thus spared. But Kamler's record of constructing death camps, their role in the murder of millions and his use of slave labour, was not it seems right 
for rehabilitation into the United States. Instead of a new life in America, Reuter believes that Kamler gave the Americans all the information they asked for, and in return, he was allowed to flee Germany and join the infamous Rat Lines. The Rat Lines were systems of escape for Nazi leaders and war criminals at the end of the war. The routes either went through Spain or through Rome and Genoa. Both routes would eventually take them to South America, particularly Argentina. These rat lines were often supported by the clergy of the Catholic Church and, of course, the Vatican. The Americans were also known to use these lines to smuggle Nazi strategists and scientists. We can only speculate what information Kamler gave to the Allies to ensure his protection. He seems to have disappeared off the face of the earth. His crimes barely mentioned at the Nuremberg trials. The trials were a huge operation involving the trial of 199 individuals, which included 24 of the highest ranking Nazis who had been captured and who were still alive. On top of this, Kamler was not hunted for by Mossad, like Eichmann for example, and nor was he hunted for by the Simon Wiesenthal Centre. Wiesenthal was a survivor of the Nazi death camps and dedicated his life to documenting the crimes of the Holocaust and to hunting down the perpetrators still at large. When history looks back, Wiesenthal explained, I want people to know the Nazis weren't able to kill millions of people and get away with it. His work stands as a reminder and a warning for future generations. And yet again, barely a mention is given to Kamler. In 2012, Reuter requested from the US Department of Justice to view records about Kamler. All he received was a set of what he called a set of highly redacted documents. In 2019, trying again, he made another Freedom of Information Act request and was told this time that the government had no record of any kind on Kamla. As one archivist told him, it was like somebody came in and cleaned the files. So did Kamla escape to Argentina, or did he meet his fate in Europe at his own hand or by another's? Kamla's whereabouts during the last weeks of the war became sketchy. Werner von Braun reported to have seen him in April of 1945, and overheard a conversation saying he was planning to go into hiding near Oberammergau in Bavaria. A wartime diary relating to the surrender of the mountain resort town of Garmisch to Allied troops mentions Kamler and his staff. It is said that Kamler and his staff of some 600 personnel with good quality cars and trucks arrived in Oberammergau on the 22nd of April 1945. But their arrival was badly received by the local authorities who had several arguments with Kamla himself. An Oberleutnant Berger reported that they soon left as American forces began entering the town. Fifteen years after the war, Kamla's driver was interviewed, and he stated that Kamla died on the 10th of May 1945, but interestingly, he did not know the cause of death. Twenty years after the war, Kamla's aide, Heinz Zerner, believed that Kamla had died on the 7th of May. He, as well as some other eyewitnesses, believed the cause of death was cyanide poisoning. And to make matters even more confused, in 1969, Bern Ruland's book on Werner von Braun claimed that Kamler died when he and 21 SS men were attacked by 500 Czech resistance fighters on the 9th of May. Kamler apparently was shot by his aide-de-camp to prevent his capture. In none of these reports, there was never a body discovered. Was he killed at the end of the war, or was he smuggled out of Europe in exchange for information? Whatever happened to this monster of Auschwitz, who oversaw the murder of millions, he seems to have escaped justice. What do you think? Let us know in the comments below. Staying with the Second World War, if you've always had a soft spot for the Battle of Britain, then click here and listen to the diary entries of a Spitfire pilot of the Royal Air Force. Thanks for watching.